Okay, welcome back to the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba. This is part two, where we look at the pieces that are located inside the museum. Part one, we looked at the outdoor pieces, and that video is up on the channel, and you can check that out later. Enjoy. Here we got a whole bunch of examples of the munitions used. Little smooth cannonballs, 12 pounders, 18 pounders. So they have a couple examples of like a, I would call it like an old fashioned cannon. Just a smooth bore gun. So no rifling at all, this is a six pounder. So we're using British North America. It goes back to the mid 1700s. Okay, this structure, if you can see it. Bit of a low ceiling. Oh, cool. Okay, so this is, it's very dark. This is set up like a little bunker. So they got the gun parked in here. I don't know if you can see it. There's a guy sleeping in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, there's a poison gas mask. Gas attacks in the First World War killed over 90,000 soldiers, wounded 1.2 million. Gas shelling was often used against gun positions on both sides. That's nasty. First gas masks were a little more than handkerchiefs soaked in chemicals and rapidly evolved into more effective designs. I should hope so. Here's the other side of that bunker that we were just in. So here's all the sandbags. There's the gun. 13 pound quick firing gun. Standard equipment for the British Royal Horse Artillery and the Canadian Royal, Royal Canadian Horse Artillery during First World War. Vimy, Vimy Ridge, 1917. Artillery paved the way for the capture of Vimy Ridge by Canadian Corps in April 1917. So he directed a bombardment of over 35,000 British and Canadian gunners manning over 1,000 guns and mortars that began on the March 20th and they kept going into April. This is 17 centimeter Mittler. A trench mortar was captured at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. So this was used by the Germans and this was captured. And this is a 4.5 inch quick firing howitzer used by Canadian gunners, remained in service for training into uh, the Second World War. Sixty, that's six zero pounder gun, breech loading gun, used for mobile coast defense in Canada and counter bombardment on the Western Front in 1914 to 1918, so this is World War One. That's this puppy right here. Yeah, look at the size of these shells. Like, for comparison, I'll stand beside them and you can kind of see how high they are. There's more over here too. I'm guessing the photo was like a recreation event or something, but there's the uniform. Military horse. This is a French cannon here, a 75 millimeter French cannon. This room, now we're getting into like this, this is the older stuff, so I'm gonna guess this is all French. Or not not French, but all horse drawn stuff. What visitors are welcome to try on uniforms? It's a little bit small. This is a one pounder pom pom, it was called. Quick firing gun designed by Hiram Maxim, known as the pom pom for the sound it made during firing. World's first automatic cannon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, the crank. Oh, 
Oh, oh, look, it's got a pistol grip. It's got a pistol grip. It does. Huh. Neat. Initially, the British Army didn't want the pom pom until uh, they were on the receiving end of, a, of this gun from the, what, South Africa? Yeah, South African Republic. And then after that, they decided we're going to put some into the service too. <laughs> so then the British adopted it. So this, this gun here, the 15 pound rifle breech loading gun was used to carry Her Majesty Queen Victoria during the state funeral. Huh. Nine gunners, nine drivers, and 20 horses to haul us around. But this actual gun was used to carry the queen. The gun carriage is one of those which was used to carry the body of Her Late Majesty Queen Victoria during her, fu her funeral in 1901. Now, I don't know how well this will show up on camera because the lights seem to be off. But, oh, the lights come on. This is the gun vault. Oh, it's all broken up by era. So this is colonial. It's like colonial weapons. You got muskets. Carbine. Oh, look at the old pistols. The old, just a one shot pull and pray. The tiny guy, pocket pistols, 1840s. And then it goes around as it gets more modern. So this is early Canada, and then you move into carbines and rifles, revolvers, 36 cal. This is neat. Double action thunderer. Colt. I like the, the looks of them. Yeah. Like, well, like especially like this guy here. Those, those the caps. I, I like this guy here. Colt. United States, 1851. This is awesome. Okay, now we move into the 1885 and the Boer War. That looks like an incredibly heavy handgun. Oh, that would be. That'd be bulky. Royal Small Arms Factory, United Kingdom. And what? Retail? Oh, that's a flare gun. A flare. What? Also a flare gun. Yeah. Okay. This is a machine gun. This is a. MG08, German machine gun. It can't even fit it the same. There it is. Okay, we just saw one of our favorite guns. The Mauser with a stock. Huh. That one looks familiar too. A Luger. Yes, I've heard of those too. Yeah, it's a longer barrel. Yeah. Well, look in the corner, Jim. Mm -hmm. Machine gun. Vickers. It's kind of hard to see the reflections, but it's in there. Oh, wow. It almost looks like this is the, the 30s, like between the two world wars. Looks like these handguns almost got smaller in size. Lee Einfield, number four, mark one. 303. This one has a. Is that the bayonet kind of thing on there? It looks more like just a spike. Uh, it's only really needed, I guess. A Bren, a Bren machine gun. United Kingdom. Here's a Browning. Browning machine gun. It's an Uzi. Yeah, yeah this is an Israeli gun, eh? The Uzi? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's this one has like the Woodstock. This one's the one that I, I sort of like in the 80s, like every action movie used these for some reason. Very more modern rifle, eh? C7. Yeah, 60s to present. Yeah, okay, so this is the modern stuff here. Oh yeah, AK-47s, of course. Anti-tank. Machine gun. Oh, this is a Canadian machine gun. C5A1, Canada. Canadian version of a Browning MG. Okay, we're gonna continue on. I'm guessing by the angle this is anti-aircraft. Light anti-aircraft gun, 40 millimeter bow fours, two pound rounds. Oh look, you can see the rounds. Right there. This is a five and a half inch howitzer Mark III. In Canada, use five and a half inch howitzers to conduct long range fire and counter battery bombardments. Weight of projectiles 100 pounds. Range about 14 kilometers with 100 pound shells. You need 10 men, a gun, and a tractor. What's this thing? Self propelled howitzer. Yeah, 50 cal. Fifty cal on the turret. I gotta back up just to get a. Yeah, don't don't trip over all the other munitions lying around. One hundred and five millimeter howitzer, thirty two pound rounds. Designed to built in the USA, priests were used in action by the Canadians and Italians, Northwest Europe. 1944, so that'd be like, uh, yeah, World War II still. Used in D-Day, I guess. After D-Day, 72 was the birth of the first Canadian auto pistol carriers. Used, used as APCs after D-Day? Okay. Used as APCs. All right. Okay, here we have a 25 pound gun. An artillery limber. Used to carry ammunition. Oh yeah, it's kind of hard to see in the dark, but basically you have, they're all locked in there, which is probably a good thing. Oh no, they're not. Pull them out. Take them to the gun. Yeah, this is D-Day, June 6, 1944. On the first day, Canadians captured more of their objectives farther inland than any other Allied division. However, D-Day saw 574 Canadians wounded, 340 killed. And this is a general purpose carrying unit. It's a little dim in here, but we'll hear some pictures of it being used. Universal carrier. So you could use this just to carry people around or tow tow guns around or whatever you wanted to do. Designed to move infantry across fire swept ground. Carried a brand light machine gun. It's 29,000 versions were manufactured in Canada. Huh. So this, oh this is like, so this is like Canadian yeah. Okay. Is that a spear? Like an arrowed? It was like a little thrower, I think. Oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. So like this handle, you'd... Oh, geez, I don't want to... Okay. Yeah, it would It would have a notch here. I, I, I never... Okay, I didn't know we had these in Canada. I've seen... I've read about other other cultures somewhere in the world that you, they had something like this. Like I, I want to see it in Australia. The Aboriginals in Australia had something like this, and they could like just whip these spears 
because you basically use the uh, the thrower as leverage. Mm -hmm. Brandon House. Are these parts off of musket? Oh, that's neat. What you got? I got some uh, just some parts from a musket they found, and they kind of got where it would fit. Okay. They only got a few, but not much. Found at York Factory, firing lock plate, flint, and trigger guard. Mm. Arms trade. The last French attack. Okay, so this is going into more of the, the history of warfare in Canada. Yeah. I didn't even know this was in here. Mm -hmm. Last military action by France in Manitoba occurred in the support of the American Revolution. British and French trade rivalry had continued up to the defeat of New France in Eastern Canada in 1760. In 1782, the French struck a final blow against their long-standing enemy. The French fleet of three warships carrying 250 soldiers captured and sacked Hudson Bay Company posts in Fort Prince of Wales and York Factory. Fifteen French soldiers were accidentally drowned coming ashore were the last naval engagement in Manitoba waters. Mm -hmm. These captured ports were returned to the Hudson Bay Company in 1783, like a year later. Okay, I had no, I, I'm learning stuff here. I'm, I can't show this all. You gotta come and check out the museum, but I didn't know this. In 1871, the Irish Republic Army made its last attack on Canada at Pemina, near present day Emerson. I didn't know there was a first attack. The Irish apparently were attacking Canada. This is all news to me. Hmm. The Fenians were an Irish American society of Civil War veterans who raided Canada in order, in order to keep British troops in North America, hoping that they would allow Ireland to rebel and win its freedom. So they're trying to like occupy mm -hmm. troops in Canada to keep them away from Ireland. I did not know that was a thing. 40 IRA men crossed the border and sacked the Hudson Bay Company post. They were pursued by US infantry who ignored the border in order to intercept them. Huh. That was the last invasion of Canada. Huh. Here's a tidbit I didn't know. So I kind of have heard of some of this, like retiring Canadian soldiers were eligible for some financial assistance to buy farms or housing or whatever. Uh, since World War I, thousands of First Nations people served in the Canadian military with hundreds of killed in actions, but they were not able to vote in Manitoba provincial elections until 1952, or in Canadian elections until 1960. I did not realize that even until recent times, they were not allowed to vote. They were also denied many veterans benefits until 2002, having fought overseas for Canada, First Nation veterans then had to fight hard at home. Old motorcycle here. Maximum speed 100 kilometers an hour. Flat train in Normandy with paved roads. Yeah, you can use it for communication. Riders in Canadian Army gained a reputation for fast and aggressive riding. Yeah, I'd be fast and aggressive too if someone was shooting at me. See that? That's where they got some uh, cross sections of mortar shells. Oh, yeah. You got like a cutaway. Mm -hmm. Trying to get a picture without me in the shadows here. It wouldn't be a Canadian operation without a little bit of hockey in here. <laughs> Canadian gunners were hockey pioneers playing some of the earliest games in Kingston in 1870. We're kind of drawn over to the uh, Oh, is this? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Just like I'm outside. Yeah, it's got the big yeah, flared out end. The blow. Yeah. The blowback. Recoilless rifle, 106 millimeter. In the picture, they have it mounted on top of a EPC or something like that. Get a shot. Lightweight, could be mounted on a Jeep or APC, handled by a detachment of four soldiers. Neat. Hmm. So I guess this part of the is more into the Cold War era. So we still got the howitzers. What's this big guy? 
155 millimeter howitzer. Well, look, you can look in the, in the, down the barrel. Look at this guy. Holy. It's got some heft to it. Can you see anything? If you look down, oh yeah. I don't know if it'll show up in the camera, it's very dark, but you can see the rifling in there too. Okay, so this this isn't a tank. It's a self-propelled howitzer. I'm gonna guess the difference is like the armor, but I really don't know. It's probably some of the range. This goes up to 18 kilometers. 18 kilometer range. Special ammunition you can go to 22 kilometers. Nice. And they got this thing open, so you can like here. See, there's a couple benches there. I guess this is where the guys would sit. And load from there. Huh. You can look in the back there. Is this where you would load the rounds, I guess? Um, I'm guessing this would be like a storage compartment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also got a Machine gun on the top. No entry. Well, yeah, okay. That's fair. <laughs> I like how there's like equipment and edges everywhere. It's like no matter which way you turn around, you're going to hit yourself on something. Okay, this is a Javelin surface air missile. Okay, so it is on the stand. It was a Canadian service from 1990 to 2005. British made, lightweight, daylight, clear weather, low level surface to air missile. Looks like a surveillance drone. We got like the uh, rotating camera guy in the front here. CU-161 Spur were was Canada's first UAV operated in combat. Eyes in the skies in Afghanistan from 03 to 2009. Oh, just general purpose armored vehicle. Okay. From 1976, Grizzly. Armor weapons demonstrated the shift to more confrontational peacekeeping. Canadian forces used a grizzly extensively during operations in former Yugoslavia. So you could put a 50 cal on it or a coaxial 7.62 general purpose machine gun. You could hold the driver, a gunner, and seven passengers. Here's a, a tracked APC looking guy. He's got two guns, one forward, one rear. A little machine gun facing rear. This is painted up in the white UN. This is called a Lynx CRV. Replaced the Ferret Scout car. Was the principal Canadian command and reconnaissance vehicle. Based on the M113 armored personnel character with a smaller hull and the engine moved to the rear. not show it all there's just too much here you have to come look for yourself but what I have seen you've seen too so that's gonna do it from the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum uh, I've never been here before I highly recommend you come check it out like we did not spend too much time here but you could you could easily spend 
like three or four hours looking at all this equipment and reading all the signs. We, we sort of have just sort of skimmed over it. But uh, a lot of interesting stuff here. This is definitely going to be the kind of place where I come back someday and see what's new. And uh, you go through it three times, you probably see different stuff every time. But thanks for watching. If you like this video, there is an outdoor portion as well. Go check that out. And uh, hit subscribe, it helps out my channel. Thanks for watching.